Welcome to Protect Our Youth Online, a virtual event to start the conversation. I want to thank our host, the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, known as OJJDP. My name is Joe Laramie, and I am a retired Missouri Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force Commander, and currently a program manager with the National Criminal Justice Training Center of Fox Valley Technical College. I will be the moderator for today's event. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce Jeffrey Gersh, Deputy Associate Administrator of the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, who will provide today's opening remarks. Good afternoon. I am Jeffrey Gersh, Deputy Associate Administrator in the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, or OGJDP. I am excited to introduce this important event. In our modern world, we live on the internet. We connect, we learn, we grow, we Google everything. It's amazing, but it can also be dangerous, especially for our children. They may all be digital experts, but they are decidedly not security experts. That's where we come into play. We must work together to protect our children from the multitude of threats that loom in cyberspace. Today, leading experts in the field will share vital information with you on how to keep our children safe from online exploitation. The scope of child sexual exploitation is staggering. For instance, in 2004, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, commonly referred to as NCMEC, reviewed 450,000 child sexual abuse files. In 2019, just 15 years later, they reviewed 70 million. Sextortion is a prominent form of child sexual abuse. In this insidious crime, perpetrators use coercion or blackmail to acquire nude images of children to engage in sex with them or obtain money. Often the crime begins when perpetrators groom or trick children into sharing nude images of themselves. As many as one in six youth have shared such images online, according to a recent survey. A full 60% of sextortion victims know the perpetrator, but 51% did not report the incident to family or friends, and only 13% reported it to law enforcement. OGJDP's Internet Crimes Against Children or ICAC Task Force Program is a national network of 61 coordinated task forces representing more than 5,400 federal, state, and local law enforcement and prosecutorial agencies. The task forces help state and local agencies enhance investigative capabilities and expand victim services and community education. In 2021 alone, the task force has conducted more than 145,000 investigations of technology-facilitated crimes against children. The task force has also made more than 6,800 presentations on internet safety that reach more than 400,000 people. But law enforcement can't win this battle alone. Today, with this internet safety event, OJJDP and the ICAC task forces are asking for your help. Start a conversation. Talk to your children about the dangers of sexting and sextortion. Get comfortable with uncomfortable situations and conversations. Have them often. Make sure your kids know that you are a trusted adult, that no mistake is too big, and that they can always come to you for help. And know that you are not alone. OJJDP will remain dedicated to supporting children, parents, and law enforcement as we all work together to combat online crimes against children to help make the internet a safer place for our children. Thank you for being here, and I hope you have a great event. Thank you, Jeff. And for our first session of the day, I'd like to introduce Belinda Swan, Outreach Manager with the National Center for Missing Exploited Children. Belinda, please tell us about yourself and the work of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Good morning, Joe, and good morning to everyone in attendance. I wanna start out by thanking each and every one of you for taking the time uh, to join us and to learn more about these very important topics. Uh, the, those opening remarks, I, I was off camera, but you, you would have seen me if I did have my camera on saying yes, yes, yes to everything. Uh, we continue to see an increase in reports and we'll get into that in just a few minutes. Uh, and so it is vitally important that we create a community approach by educating one another and sharing resources. And I hope that that's exactly what you'll take away after my presentation this morning. A little bit about myself as as Joe mentioned, I serve as an outreach manager uh, in our Austin, Texas office. I grew up in South Texas, but have been in Austin for 22 years. I got to know NCMEC by uh, my work at, at the Texas Attorney General's Office Law Enforcement Division, where I was uh, so honored to be assigned to the Cybercrimes Unit 
where I assisted with uh, downloading a cyber tip line reports and in outreach efforts as well. Uh, took me a while to, to come on back home uh, to NICMIC and uh, this has got to be my dream job. I've seen uh, how things can go horribly wrong when we don't talk to children about these issues and it's just a truly an honor to be able to speak to parents, families and professionals about how we can work together to prevent another child uh, from a similar fate. So. I will reiterate again those opening remarks about how we continue to see increases and in about how, and I love that there was one quote in particular uh, that while this generation are uh, you know, digitally savvy, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are uh, uh, safety savvy, right? And that's up to us as trusted adults to make sure that we're making those linkages for them. And again, hopefully after today's presentation, you'll feel more empowered uh, to have these conversations with your children. As you can see, uh, we were founded in 1984 in part by John and Rive Walsh, who I'm sure you recognize from, from many of their efforts in this space. Uh, in addition to other families in the wake of several missing children cases in the late 70s and early 80s. And as the video shared, it was at the time, it appeared to be easier to track a stolen car than a missing child. And so these families took, many of which took their own personal tragedies to found the National Center and to help aid efforts so that every family had the, the tools that they need uh, to, to help to prevent these issues and that every family in crisis had a place to turn. So it is on that foundation that we were created. As you can see from the side, we are a nonprofit, non-governmental organization. Most importantly, I'd like to share, of course, we're congressionally funded in, in part to, to conduct outreach such as today's event. Uh, but most importantly, we serve as a national resource center for families, law enforcement, and other professionals. So many different elements of the work that we do were featured in that video. And if anything struck you or resonated with you, please do reach out. My contact information will be available in a few slides uh, to learn more, or if you'd like to, uh, to, to be connected with any of the resources or, or teams that you saw in that video please do let me know. Uh, another key takeaway that I hope that you noticed is that we continue to evolve. So in 1984, internet crimes weren't necessarily an issue, but today they certainly are. And I hope that you saw that we highlighted uh, uh, the advent of our cyber tip line and uh, all of the different ways that we harness technology to continue to keep children safe. So, and as things continue to change, NICMIC will continue to change. Whatever it takes to work together to continue to provide families and children with the resources they need and with law enforcement educators, child welfare professionals, everyone in our community is, is the theme of the day, right? A community approach to keep our children safe. Whatever that takes, NICMIC will continue to evolve to meet those needs as well. As such, our mission is to find missing children prevent child sexual exploitation and to prevent future victimization is, and that's exactly why each and every one of us is here today. Hope is why NICMIC is here. It's on our shirts, it's, uh, it's our mantra, and it truly drives every single NICMIC employee. So uh, of course, the topic of the day is internet safety and some of the different things that the National Center is seeing via our cyber tip line, which you've heard mentioned a few times this morning already, and 1-800-THE-LOST. Uh, those are the two mechanisms by which you can contact the National Center any time of the day. Never let language be a barrier if you have a client or an issue uh, uh, related to a client or someone in your community or family and they speak a language other than English. We do work with Language Line and we will absolutely work tirelessly to make sure that their needs are met as well. So a few, a few things to keep in mind. Again, 1-800-THE-LOST and cybertipline.org. So at this point in the presentation, before we talk about ways we can work together to prevent these things from happening, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the data that we see at the National Center. We're gonna talk very high level, but nonetheless, it is very illustrative of the kinds of things that we're seeing, and they certainly validate everything you heard in today's opening remarks as well. So the cyber tip line, first and foremost, if you're not familiar, and again, you've heard it mentioned a couple of times, it was highlighted in the video that I shared, cybertipline.org, 1-800-THE-LOST, again, is the hotline. Uh, the cyber tip line is the, is the mechanism at the National Center where folks can report instances of uh, child sexual exploitation. So what happens when someone reports to the cyber tip line? What happens when someone logs on, goes on to cybertipline.org and reports an issue of some kind? Let me tell you that NICMIC has some of the best analysts that exist. Uh, and those analysts work tirelessly every single day to mine through each and every single report. Obviously we have an algorithm that helps in those efforts, but nonetheless, 
each report gets reviewed and prioritized based on the information provided. So of course, I, I implore you to consider when reporting to the cyber tip line to include as much information as possible. So our analysts take a look at these reports and they'll assign it a priority level. If a child is in imminent danger, of course, that's gonna be a priority one and so on and so forth. What happens next, because uh, we do serve as a repository of sorts for all of these kinds of reports and information via the, the tip line and the hotline, we are able to run these types of reports that are made to the tip line against our data to see if there aren't any existing linkages that may help us to identify the victim, that may help us to identify the perpetrator, and most importantly, to connect them with services, uh, those, those victims that is, and also to help law enforcement to find those perpetrators and bring them to justice as well. So after our, our analysts have uh, uh, received the report, analyzed the information, uh, assigned it a priority level, added value to that report, they will then make sure that it is sent, that report, that package is sent to the appropriate law enforcement agency for follow-up and investigation. So that's what happens when you report to the cyber tip line. I'd also like to highlight that every time you call a report uh, or report online, you will be offered uh, mental health supports and peer support as well. And we'll talk about uh, some of those services later in the presentation, but there's so much more to simply filing a report with NCMEC. You are also gaining access to a team of mental health providers, folks uh, who have lived experience, uh, who are, are ready and able to assist not only the victim, the survivor, but their family as well, because at NCMEC, we recognize that these types of crimes affect not just the child uh, at the heart of the investigation, but the entire family. So a couple of things to think about, but I just wanted to provide uh, you a brief uh, overview. Again, you'll hear us talk about the cyber tip line in our hotline uh, again and again in every single one of our presentations, but, but we feel it's important that you understand exactly what it is and how it's utilized and all of the different uh, supports that are available when you do call or file an online report to the National Center. So let's talk about who's reporting to the National Center via, via the, the, the cyber tip line. As you can see, we consistently receive reports by the public and we also maintain strong relationships with all of the major electronic service providers. We continue to see an increase in reports just across the board. There's several reasons for that. Of course, events such as this make more folks aware of these resources, so we hope that that uh, affects, but also we continue to see an increase in these types of crimes as well. So two pieces that uh, continue to uh, reflect an increase in these reports, but just to kind of share with you uh, the, the types of reports that we receive and from whom I, I thought it would be important to share this slide with you. So as we start talking about why it's so important uh, to, to, uh, to utilize uh, prevention resources and to talk to our children, to start the conversation about internet safety, let's take a look again at the, at the numbers, the sheer numbers of reports that we continue to receive. You see a giant jump, right, in cyber tip line reports on this slide from 2019 to 2020. It's easy to say or make some inferences here. Uh, we saw the height of COVID lockdowns, more children were at home, uh, learning and socializing online, many of them unsupervised. However, in 2021, when we started to see some of those lockdowns lifted, we continued to see an increase. So we can't solely uh, um, attribute this increase on COVID closures and, and kind of uh, uh, that aspect. It's certainly a contributing aspect. We do not want to take away from that. But I believe, and we believe that we also continue to see a shift in behavior. For instance, this meeting today, right? Uh, uh, last I checked, we had uh, over 800 participants, I'm assuming from all over the world. Uh, we we're able to do so from the comfort of our homes or offices, this is something that's not going to go away, right? We're not going to go back to some of the things that we were doing before COVID kind of triggered the way that we interact with one another online. Children certainly are not going to take a step backward, right? They're going to continue to find new and exciting ways uh, to engage with one, one another on the internet. One of the, the anecdotes I share when I present about this information to, to parents and families especially is consider all of the ways our youngest children engage online. I have a seven-year-old daughter myself and one of her favorite treats are goldfish crackers, right? 
Um, if you buy a package of goldfish crackers, there is a QR code that you can scan and your kiddos can play with animated goldfish crackers. My child is acutely aware of this and wants to use my phone every chance she can. Uh, why? Because she doesn't know a world without the ability to access information, to access her family, to access the world around her without the internet. So I share that just to try to get us in that mind frame, right? Behind all of these reports are actual children who have shifted the way that they interact with the world around them. Important to consider as we continue to take a little deep dive here. So uh, 2020 absolutely saw an increase. 2021 was no different. Um, we did parse out a little bit of our data to indicate as well that not only did we see increases in reports overall, but especially with regard to online enticement reports. And that's reflected on the, on the slide that you're looking at now. So just to reiterate, in 2021, the cyber tip line received 29.3 million reports. I'll say that again, 29.3 million reports. Uh, if that doesn't call attention to the, to the need for today's conversation, I don't know what else does. Uh, a little bit of a breakdown here, a little uh, almost 45 million videos uh, when we're considering the types of reports associated uh, or, or uh, included with these reports uh, and images on just about 40 million and uh, a little almost 200,000 other types of files, which can be just about anything. But the bulk of these reports were related to videos and to images. So when we talk about that increase in child sexual exploitation, what are we talking about? What is child sexual exploitation? What are some of the different examples we're seeing? Uh, this is a list in order of uh, frequency, the types of reports we continue to see at the National Center. Uh, I wanna highlight for you first that at NCMEC, we no longer refer to uh, child sexual abuse material as child pornography. Indeed, we refer to it as child sexual abuse material. And I'll, I'll quickly tell you why. When we say child pornography, it almost assumes that the child had something to do with it. Some type of um, uh, ownership or stake or that there's some sort of uh, um, responsibility for what happened to that child. We don't say that at NCMEC. We call it by exactly what this is, which is child sexual abuse material. These are images of children being sexually abused being coerced to uh, share sexually explicit photos in many instances as well. And we'll talk about that in a few slides. So I hope that after today that you will join us in, in moving the conversation forward as we continue to try to prevent these issues. We first have to recognize what this issue is, which is child sex abuse, right? So let's not say child pornography anymore. Let's work toward referring to it as child sexual abuse materials or CSAM for short. Uh, obviously, we all love a good acronym and this one certainly uh, does its job job. Next, online enticement of children for sexual acts, which of course refers to when an adult uh, communicates with a child or a person that they assume is a child uh, for the purposes of sexual acts. Doesn't necessarily mean sexual contact, could be sexual conversations, role play, uh, and the like. Uh, next is child sex trafficking, uh, then child sex tourism, child sexual molestation on familial, unsolicited obscene material sent to children. This happens more often than you'd think, generally via direct messages or DMs as the kids call it. Misleading domain names, absolutely folks uh, will do so. They'll, they'll uh, tweak a few letters or numbers in a, a popular children's website with the sole intent of, of exposing children to inappropriate material misleading words or digital images on the internet, same purpose. So here's a list of the kinds of things we're seeing uh, when we talk about the increase in reports, we talk about how specifically we continue to see an increase in, uh, in online exploitation. We want you to understand the types of reports specifically that we continue to see uh, behind all of that data. Again, just to highlight those top three. So let's talk a little bit more about online enticement. And we're doing this, I, I, I wanna highlight on, online enticement specifically because we continue to see that increase. And because this, is, this just showcases again, why we're here today and why we need to have these conversations with our children. So as you saw from the data, we saw a 16.5% increase in the number of reports of online enticement in 2021. We know that behind every single one of those reports is a child, right? Who needs our assistance, who needs our, our support. 
Uh, this category, as we mentioned, includes sextortion, which you will continue to hear about uh, throughout the day. And if you follow a lot of like-minded organizations, you will continue to see more and more information shared with the public about this issue because we continue to see such a sharp increase in this specific type of online activity. Sextortion is an instance in which a child is groomed to take sexually explicit images, meet face to face with someone for sexual purposes or engage in a sexual conversation online. The difference here though, what happens when someone is sextorted and, and this is closely linked to what we consider blackmail, uh, a child may fully believe that they are in a loving, trusting relationship with someone. Uh, and, and as their vulnerabilities um, are heightened and their inhibitions are lowered, they feel comfortable uh, once they've been asked to produce sexual content, sexual images. And unfortunately, once the perpetrator receives those images, those videos, they absolutely turn on the child, reveal themselves uh, to be not necessarily the predator's name and address and location, et cetera, but reveal themselves to be uh, a, a, a perpetrator or predator instead and start to make demands of the child, whether monetary or uh, you need to, to continue to make these videos or you will meet with me in person or, and, and again, we're talking about child sex abuse here, right? So we can make linkages to what we consider child abuse uh, it, it, these kinds of things are going to sound so familiar to you, and, and I hope that you'll continue to make those linkages between what we're talking about here with online enticement and child abuse. The perpetrator may start to make threats like, well, because obviously they've nurtured a relationship. I know where you go to school, so I'm going to humiliate you and share this with everyone at your school. I know where your parents work. I'm going to go to their work and hurt them. Uh, your little sister or brother is next, right? All of these kinds of things sound like what we uh, typically associate with, with child abuse. Online enticement is no different in many instances. Before uh, we continue our discussion on, on resources and prevention, let's talk about some other trends that we're seeing with, with children. Children are increasingly uh, participating in all of the types of activity that you see on your screen. Sexting, online enticement, as we've discussed in, in detail, as well as sextortion and live streaming. And again, I challenge you for the rest of today's conversation to um, look beyond your, your, your perceptions about uh, the way kids uh, um, interact online. Um, I'll share with you, and I think it's important to, for all of us to kind of have a real moment uh, with ourselves. I'm 44 years old, and I grew up half of my life without the internet, not an ounce of smart technology. Um, and I, I clearly remember instances of, you know, your car breaks down on the way home, good luck to you, right? You, you better figure it out. Uh, you better find uh, someone, hopefully uh, an officer will stop by, you know, all of those kinds of things. You're, you have a flat tire, uh, uh, something, there's smoke coming out of, of your hood. Uh, I'm probably still not going to YouTube it or Google it. I'm, I'm going to try to problem solve in a way that's very much aligned with my personal lived experiences. So let's cast aside judgment uh, and, and understand, and my colleague, who you will hear from later today, Jen Newman, uh, says, said this, and it just resonated with me so much. This generation is a generation of digital natives. So obviously, all of the ways that we grew up, uh, exploring the world around us, experimenting, questioning, uh, you know, our changing bodies, our relationships, uh, how we viewed ourselves, our, our curiosity about sex, all of those same, same kinds of things are still happening. But today's generation is doing it with the entire world just a couple of buttons away on their smart device. So again, I encourage you to cast aside any preconceived notions or judgment. Some of this can seem very jar jarring, but when we reflect back on our own experiences as young tweens and teens and beyond, um, let's have some empathy for our children first so that we can better understand and support them. Uh, so, so some trends that we continue to see across the board, uh, children are, are increasingly engaged in sexting, 
Uh, and, and as a result, many times online enticement, sextortion and live streaming. Live streaming is extremely popular. And of course, as you saw in the video I shared with you earlier, um, we continue to evolve because predators continue to evolve. Predators know where to find children. So we need to know where our children are hanging out online as well. Again, I challenge you to make those connections between uh, in-person behavior and online behavior. You would never let your child uh, go uh, be picked up by a stranger to go hang out for six hours at a time without asking who they are, uh, who are their parents, where do they live, I need a phone number, I need all of the, these pieces of information before I let you out that door. Are we asking those same kinds of questions about the folks that they're interacting with online? Right. That uh, Today, if anything you take away, first, that we have resources and support for you, obviously, and second, are you extending those same kinds of conversations and concerns about in-person safety to online safety with your children? Self-produced content is seen in children of all ages. I think it's easy to make that connection or to understand this very scary uh, realization when we consider that we never, uh, not for some time now, gift children uh, brick phones or tablets that don't connect to the internet. Um, they're certainly not gaming on platforms that aren't internet enabled. Nintendo Switch, PlayStation, Xbox, your cell phone, uh, you know, all of the ways. Their school issued tablet. Again, I have a seven year old first day of kindergarten. She received a tablet. So obviously, this is an issue of um, access. And we'll get into that in a second. But I share that because I don't want you to feel like, uh, and oftentimes, and I present it to parents uh, often. You know, is this generation just bad? Are they just, you know, no, they're not sexual deviants. They simply, again, have uh, access to the entire world uh, at their fingertips in their pocket on devices that we bought them, right? But when we are presenting them with these devices, are we saying, I trust you with this. I trust you to have this cell phone. I trust you to have this new uh, uh, PlayStation. But here are some rules and guidelines. Here are some expectations before you're able to start uh, uh, utilizing this item. So NCMEC has received reports of online enticement of children on almost every digital platform. So a couple of things before we talk, now that I've scared everyone, um, uh, a couple of things to remember as we move toward our discussion of prevention materials in every age group. Uh, and on every platform, right? So there is no good platform or bad platform. Wherever there is a child and the internet, there is an opportunity for online enticement, right? Just something that is our reality. So again, I'll say it one more time, <laughs> increases in all of the above, all of the different things that we discussed, uh, all ages and every platform. So how do we tackle this? How do we even begin to have this conversation? It seems overwhelming because it is overwhelming. What is the top threat facing young children online? As you, you heard me mention, it's access. Again, I will repeat that, it's access. We are not giving our child, uh, our children uh, uh, outdated tools. We are, they, you know, Christmas, birthdays, whatever it is that, you know, that we recognize and how we celebrate. Oftentimes, uh, even if we don't recognize or celebrate by gifting smart technology, they have access to it at school. They have access to it at, uh, at a friend's house. They have access to it with after school programming. So it's not just what, what they're doing at home, it's also how they're engaging with one another online when they're not at home. And that's why it's so important to have these conversations with their children. Just to reiterate, as we continue to go down the line of our resources, this is child sexual abuse facilitated by the internet. I think once we all can accept that and agree on this, we are 10 times more motivated to utilize resources to have these conversations with our children. We are not being overly dramatic when we say this. I hope that the data highlighted for you exactly why it's important to consider these instances of online exploitation, child sexual abuse, because that's what it is. So let's start to treat it as such and work together. As I mentioned, this can feel overwhelming. What can we do? Let's work together. How can we work together? Well, I hope that you'll consider utilizing NCMEC's uh, prevention materials. All of our resources are free. You will never pay to access our materials. Our prevention education programming is aimed at increasing awareness. Uh, you being here with us today is certainly working in that effort. 
empowering through skill building. That's important. We'll talk about that in a second. Expanding community capacity and overall reducing the risk. So because NCMEC has access to all of this data, we're able to see real time the trends that are affecting our children. We are able to then inform the content and the format uh, of our programming. So we recognize that younger children resonate with small bite-sized content and we have developed tools to, to reach them where they are. And we'll talk about that in greater detail. But our hallmark internet safety program is called NetSmarts. NetSmarts is an online safety program for children and families in grades K through 12. We talked about how we've seen reports related to children at all ages. So we cannot simply have conversations with teenagers and make those kinds of assumptions. We have to reach our children as young as possible. As I mentioned, if you believe that your child is old enough to have access to a smart device, they're absolutely old enough to start to have these conversations and NCMEC provides you with the resources to do so. So included in our NetSmarts programming are our standard presentations. We have a presentations as you can see on your screen for kiddos uh, in grades K through two, three through five, tweens, high school, and a presentation specific for parents, guardians, and community members. Topics include overall online personal safety, which I think is integral to each of these other elements. Again, if we haven't spoken to our children about their online presence, if we have it, just as we ask whom they're hanging out with and associating with at school and when we let them out the door, we've got to ask who are you following and who's following you and why? Do you know these people in real life? So we talk about personal safety. We talk about cyberbullying. We talk about sexting. We talk about uh, uh, meeting people offline and, and why that's not a good idea. And we do so in an age appropriate way with age appropriate content. Now, each of these presentations also uh, uh, includes a, a presenter's guides and, and a script, if you will, uh, to utilize when, when sharing those presentations, activities, online games that coincide with the lessons that you've shared, tip sheets, just a multitude of ways to engage with children where they are. That's what's important. You heard me talk about those bite-sized online uh, videos. That series is called Into the Cloud. It's an animated online safety adventure series. I always, my poor kid uh, needs to get a cut of my salary at this point because I talk about her so much. Uh, she's my little guinea pig and she approves. She's a hard nut to crack and she loves Into the Cloud because again, we worked really hard to make sure that uh, these resources resonate with young children because as the data supports, we know that we have to start reaching children at a younger age. The likelihood that they will be encountered with any one of the kinds of, of things we discussed at the beginning of this presentation continues to increase. We have to arm them and prepare them. Uh, better, better said, we have to empower them with the information to make better choices and not only to make better choices, but to know that they can come to us, their trusted adults, to talk about any one of these things, especially should they encounter any one of these issues. So it's talking about the issues and it's making sure they understand that they can come to their trusted adult if and when something happens. So a little overview about what you can expect when you go home today and download into the cloud or access it on YouTube. Season one, each of these uh, episodes highlights a different online safety issue. So digital citizenship, which sets a good foundation for not being a cyber bully or for being an upstander or for speaking up to a trusted adult if and when they are cyber bullied. Online privacy, again, at the core of a lot of these issues. So we've got to start talking about it with young kids early. Cyberbullying, misleading information we talked about. You saw on that list of the different kinds of reports that we received. So certainly need to have conversations with our children about how to recognize misleading information and why it's important to talk to trusted adults when they encounter it inappropriate content and reporting unsafe behavior. Absolutely, we can start to talk to our kids about in, uh, reporting when these kinds of things happen. Again, I try to cook something, my kid wants to stir. I try to read a book, she wants to flip the pages. They want to help, they feel empowered when they feel part of the process. And we encourage that at NCMEC and have resources to help you to empower your child. Season two was just released, I say just released, almost a year ago uh, in February. Safe, uh, season two, again, we continue to take look, a look at our data and pivot to make sure that we are 
providing you with resources that uh, address the kinds of things that we're seeing. So dealing with cyberbullying, that continues to be pervasive, maintaining online privacy, reporting unsafe behavior, these things are evergreen. Live streaming safely, absolutely. If your child is a gamer, uh, you know, again, my kid's not allowed to, to play uh, certain gaming uh, games, uh, but she knows all about them because she goes to school and lives in the world with other seven-year-olds. So she comes home and talks about these kinds of things. So regardless of whether or not your child is interested or not, they're being exposed uh, to, to that kind of content, to those conversations. And so we have to prepare them for that, right? So we're, we're gonna talk about live streaming safely. And, stay, and safety and what and whether or not they are allowed to and if so what how can they do that and what should they do if they're encountered with uh perhaps an adult who hops on their their gaming chat reporting and removing inappropriate content so these topics seem overwhelming but i assure you uh take a look at, at some of these episodes and you'll see that they're done in such a way that make it effortless for you to talk about these issues with your children uh, uh in an age appropriate way We'll share links to each of these uh, seasons of Into the Cloud uh, that you will receive, I'm sure, with your follow-up information. Um, but to reiterate, season two highlights the things that you see online. Take a look at episode two, the picture, digital blackmail. What are we doing here? We're opening an age-appropriate dialogue about sextortion absolutely need to start having these conversations at a younger age. Uh, when we start to, and, and again, the example that we use at NCMEC often is that of the seatbelt. We bring our babies home in car seats. Um, they fuss, fight, and kick us uh, when they're toddlers because they don't want to be strapped into their car seat, but they are learning over time. They're watching us get into our car and put on our car seat, our car seat, our seatbelt. They're watching our behavior and they're learning learned behavior. They're experiencing learned behavior. And the hope is that eventually when they're old enough to drive, they're going to hop in the car and the first thing they'll do is put on their seatbelt. Same concept with internet safety early and often, right? These kinds of conversations and we provide the materials to do so. So a little bit of a deep dive here, season two, for instance, lessons learned, nothing done online is completely private. We have discussion starters. We provide each of these for you so that you can, if you have, if you're an educator on the call, if, uh, if you are a, a law enforcement official or, or a state government employee and you have any kind of outreach initiative, we encourage you to utilize our resources in a, in a community setting. And we provide you with all of the tools to engage with children and to challenge challenge their thinking and to make sure that they understand what's safe and what isn't. Again, you can, you will, uh, when you, after, I just know each of you are going to hop on our website after you're done today, you'll find episodes, you'll find discussion guides, and I'd like to share that we offer them in Spanish as well. Um, most of our episodes, I believe all, each episode uh, at this time uh, includes Spanish subti subtitles. Uh, uh, we are working on getting them dubbed as well, but we certainly want to make you aware that these resources are available in Spanish also. So as I mentioned, if you are interested in getting these conversations started beyond your family, what are some strategies for successful implementation? You know where to go, missingkids.org, or just Google NetSmarts, or just Google NCMEC resources. All of the things we're talking about today are going to pop right up. Now what? Well, know your audience. What age group am I talking to? Get comfortable with the topic. Read up about it. Re utilize our speaker's guides. Um, visit our website on missingkids.org. We also offer free online training on a variety of topics, including how to teach online safety. Um, get to know the statistics behind the reasons why you're sharing this information. You can consider sharing your own personal experiences, especially if you work in the field and it's age appropriate and doesn't scare children away. <laughs> Um, that's certainly something that you can do to try to build a trust bond with children. Promote skill building more than anything is promoting skill building, reinforcing positive behavior, and avoiding fear-based materials and scare tactics. I want to spend a little bit of time here and, and uh, really um, highlight why this is important. Simply telling a child not to do something isn't going to work. Think about yourself when you were a teenager or a child. Don't touch that. What's the first thing you did, right? Don't eat that, that's gonna make you sick. What's the first thing you did, right? Et cetera, et cetera. We cannot tell children just not to do something. Um, there is an excellent article that The Atlantic uh, uh, published highlighted how the amazing D.A.R.E. program took note of these, uh, this concept and really took a look at it, at the way it was uh, uh, reaching children. And it's just fascinating to see how they recognized that simply telling children no wasn't moving the needle. 
But when they started sharing with children, these are the things that could happen if you make this choice. Um, I'm not going to judge you, but I am going to be here if it happens. When we do that, when we talk to our kids directly, when we empower them with information, we're not going to shy away from the very real consequences. We're not going to lie to our kids and tell them, oh, it'll be fine. Just come and tell me everything will be fine. It might not be fine. But when we tell them, when we're honest, we empower them with information, we encourage them to make better choices, and we reinforce that we're here to listen. Um, when we check our own reactions, when they take us up on it, that's equally as important. If you've done all of this work and you've had all of these conversations, please be mindful about how you respond. Even if it's your six-year-old coming to you uh, 10 million times, personal experience here, um, and they listen uh, to say, I think this is inappropriate. I think this is inappropriate. Mama, is this inappropriate? Take that deep breath. Let's talk about it. I'm so glad that you came and told me. We're building a forever relationship based on trust so that children, because statistically, it is very likely they will encounter any one of the kinds of things we've talked about today. Because of that, we need to make sure we're also in tune with how we react when our children do turn and come to us. So again, all of this to say, Please don't uh, think that or be or feel that uh, the best approach is to simply tell kids no. And this is why I went to this NCMEC presentation. These horrible things are happening. It's probably going to happen to you, so you better not. Or worse, the first time their your child comes to you, they they trust you. You've gone through. You've done all the work, and, and then the first thing you do is flip out, change the Wi-Fi password, you know, ban them from seeing their friends, take away that cell phone the likelihood that they'll come to you again is small, right? So let's work together to promote skill building, reinforce positive behavior. Again, every time the, the now seven-year-old comes to me, mom, this is inappropriate. And I'll share this with you. Uh, we have a lot of ground to cover, but I just wanna make sure that you understand uh, that I know this works. Um, at my birthday, I received an email from IHOP that I had received a, a free stack of pancakes. And so I told my child, oh, yay, mommy got a free stack of pancakes from IHOP. And she turned to me and said, how do they know it's your birthday, mama? And I said, well, I told them I signed up for this app. But isn't that personal information you shared online? That's not very smart, mom. Okay, then, <laughs> you know, she's listening. Um, and she corrected me. And, and, and I, I couldn't help but just give her a big hug because I saw in real time that these conversations work when we engage with our children. We provide them with uh, information to help them make better choices and to recognize potentially unsafe behavior. So to recap, if you feel inspired today to either talk to your own children or to find a way to engage with the children in your community via your uh, involvement with work or a nonprofit, whatever that looks like, know your audience, uh, decide which uh, uh, presentations or, or age range of materials work best, do some research. You have a new friend in Austin, give me a call, send me an email, we'll workshop some ideas. Consider sharing those experiences as I, I like to do throughout my presentations, but most importantly, promote skill building, empower your children, empower the children in your community to make better choices. The internet's not going away. Predators are always gonna be one step ahead. They know where our children are. What we can do is work together to make sure our children know how to recognize unsafe situations, that they know what to do, and that they know that they can come to us. Let's avoid fear-based materials because we know that those don't work. I'm going to take a quick second here to see if we have any questions. I've been talking for some time now. Uh, if there are any, any thoughts or questions at this point, Joe, feel free to, to shout those out. There are um, there are a few questions, and I think that I'd like to start with this one. How does the National Center for Missing Exploited Children assist Native American communities? That's an excellent question. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we actively work. We have started, we are in our first year of our tribal fellowship. Uh, Mr. Mark Pooley is a retired tribal police officer uh, with years and years of experience, and he is helping to lead our efforts to make sure that we are sharing information and making our resources available to all tribal nations. You can find more about that on our website. We also actively participate in uh, Native American hosted conferences and opportunities such as very similar to today's uh, to share this information as well. I encourage you to, uh, to research our tribal fellowship, to, to visit our website. Um, I can also share Mr. Pooley's information as well as he continues to help us to ensure that our messaging and our resources are appropriate and are exactly uh, uh, in that reach folks where they are specific to their community's needs. 
Another question is, um, for child sexual exploitation, is it always adult offending against children or do the statistics also include child on child? There are absolutely instances where a child can sextort another child. Absolutely. It's not always uh, an adult. It can absolutely, and that includes cyberbullying as well, right? Folks can certainly report that too. Um, yes, the short answer is yes. Children are, are certainly capable of, uh, of doing any one of these things that we've discussed to another child. And there's another question on internet safety. Should discussions occur with children and parents together, or should they just be separated? That's a great question. So our NetSmarts programming, as you may have recognized from our presentations, we have one presentation specific to adults. And when we host those presentations, children are, are not uh, allowed to attend that presentation because we do talk about it in a very frank way. But the ideal approach is that you will be able to present to the children and the parents separately. And we do that often. Um, what works, what I have found that works here in the Austin community, I will uh, work with PTOs and PTAs, for instance, who will help to host a parent's night presentation. And then we have access to the school where we're able to present to the children as well, because it, it is ideal that a parent is hearing how to respond to their child and is hearing what to look for in their child's behavior, and that a child is, is also learning the same kinds of information and is being encouraged to turn to their trusted adult to share when any kind, any one of these things happen. So the short answer is uh, literally, practically, um, we encourage that parents receive the parents' presentation and children receive the children's presentation separately. Uh, but holistically, the ideal is that uh, everyone in, the, in that particular community is hearing the same messaging. Another question deals with does the National Center offer resources for young adults with autism or disabilities? Yes, we do. Many of our resources are available utilizing symbol sticks uh, to convey a lot of the same messaging in a way that is appropriate for, for children and young adults on the autism spectrum. And you can also find those on our website and I'll share links to all of that with Joe to share with the, with the audience. We also, I'd be remiss if I didn't share this, we also provide uh, resources for families with children and young adults on the autism spectrum on how best to uh, um, help prevent and address uh, issues related to wandering and how that links with missing children reports, how to engage with law enforcement, how to create uh, an emergency plan should something uh, like that happen. Uh, and again, all of those resources are free and available on our website. Great. Thank you, Belinda. Please proceed. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for your questions. So as we've discussed a few times here, just to reiterate, and your questions are amazing and um, really highlight that you're you're listening and you're ready to, to, to move forward. And I'm so excited about that. So we're gonna reiterate a few things. Encourage, but don't force participation. And we know that especially with our tweens. I could talk, I could give you a masterclass on how to present to tweens because I've had so many hilarious examples. Um, I'll share quickly, you know, presented virtually to a group of tweens where one kid uh, Googled me while I was speaking and took a snapshot of my, my profile picture and made it his profile picture and changed his name to mine. And then just started flooding my messages with, I'm the real Belinda Swan, who are you? It was hilarious. Um, but the point being is I didn't lose my cool. Rather, I said, I see you, but this is your time. Let's, let's have a chat. Let's talk about how this could happen to you and it be a stranger that did it instead and not someone that you may have met uh, uh, in person. And so again, encourage, but don't force participation. I share that funny anecdote, one, because it's hilarious. And two, because it speaks about uh, how oftentimes our children are ready to listen, but they, they might just want to test you a little bit first uh, or, or the opposite. They don't look at you at all. They just kind of sit here like this, their fingernails, their cell phones. But I assure you, they're listening. They may not give you the, uh, the feedback that you are wanting, but they're listening. And we don't want to force participation because it, then it's just one more thing that adults are trying to teach them that they are just going to tune out, right? So listen to their concerns. Every question is a good question. If you don't know the answer, be, be honest and say, I don't know the answer. Uh, and then we can work together to find the answer. Respect their experiences. Certainly had tons of instances where I've, I've shared 
and kids want to tell me either during the presentation or directly after miss i think i i think it was exploited you know and i'm going to i'm going to get on their level and i'm going to listen and we're going to work through it and we're going to also make sure that if something did indeed happen that all of the appropriate steps are taken to make sure this child receives the the, the care that they need we're going to gently correct misinformation. We know that there's a ton of misinformation about any given topic circulating at any given time. Uh, we don't want to say, no, you're wrong. We want to say, you know, I hear you, uh, but let's work together to find an answer. Or I think this is a better answer or a better way to think about what you just said. Again, we're going to avoid those fear-based tactics. We know that they don't work. Telling a child just don't do this isn't going to work. Answer their questions. Make sure that they understand that you are a trusted adult and we do have trusted adult resources on our website that encourage you um, or empower you as the trusted adult to be equipped to answer some difficult questions. And you can find those on our website as well. I believe I have an example in the coming slides. Take a break if they need it. This is heavy stuff, you know, and they're also wiggle worms as they get younger. And you'll see that reflected in our resources. We know that. So our presentations for younger children are only about 30 minutes. They include a lot of uh, animated shorts. They're bright and they're colorful, we understand that. Um, but, but I want you to consider that there are some children in your audiences that for the very first time may recognize in what you're sharing that they've been victimized. So you wanna give children space to grieve, to take a, a deep breath, to regroup, and to be able to better absorb the information that you're sharing. So we've talked about all of the ways that you can engage with your community or with your community, with your children. I've pointed you to a ton of different resources. I'd also like to share with you a more organized way or a more formal way to do this with the National Center. I am so excited to share with you that one of my job duties is also implementing our community education partner program. As I have said about a hundred times already, but we'll continue to say all of our resources are free, including participating in our community education partner program. As you can see on the screen, what this program does is it allows us to partner with trusted organizations. So those nonprofits that have been in business for at least a year and have an excellent record of, of delivering services in their community, law enforcement agencies, child advocacy centers, you name it, um, nonprofits that come to mind and we'll go through in the next couple of slides, we'll talk about some examples. So I'll, I'll, I'll wait to share that. But we provide training and technical assistance on how to deliver NetSmarts and KidSmarts. KidSmarts focuses on personal safety. Uh, it focuses on, on things like how Consider this, it is an evolution of what we used to call stranger danger, right? We know, however, we've learned because we continue to evolve and to be able to pivot to make sure we're addressing children's issues in an appropriate way that's effective. We know that when we focus on strangers, we're overlooking statistics that clearly tell us that a child is more likely to be uh, abused or exploited by someone they know. So our KidSmarts programming helps to empower children to feel comfortable to speak up not only when someone is making them uncomfortable, but to speak up and tell their trusted adult when that has happened. So um, you can visit our website to learn more about KidSmarts. But nonetheless, our com community education partner program will provide your staff with training on how to deliver NetSmarts and KidSmarts. We'll continue to provide that technical assistance. Many partners uh, will say, Belinda, I'm ready, but I need to practice. We'll schedule some time. I turn off my camera and my sound. I let them present and then I'll give them some, some honest feedback. Um, our partnership doesn't end at the signing of the local partnership agreement, which it does require. Uh, this is an ongoing opportunity to engage with NCMEC. We provide training opportunities and new resources. For instance, June, obviously, Internet uh, Safer Internet Month. So we recognize that our design team created uh, uh, visuals and graphics that our partners could share on their social media feeds to highlight statistics and resources. And we do that throughout the year for free. Um, we also uh, host uh, events where partners can come together to share experiences, to share resources, and we have partners throughout the country. So this is this has proven to be an excellent opportunity to formally partner with NICMIC and to, and to find ways to continue to, to gain an understanding of the issues and to have a, have a lifeline, uh, for lack of a better word, to NICMIC about how to share these resources in your own community. And in turn, we simply ask that you provide us with quarterly statistics, how many folks did you reach, and so on. I encourage you to, to scan that QR code or send me an email. You can 
also just visit our website, enter Community Education Partner Program in the search bar and an overview and an application will pop right up. I see every single application. I reach out to every applicant. I schedule time to talk about whether or not this is a good fit answer all of your questions and we'll get the process started there. You've heard a lot about all of our resources. Nothing precludes you from utilizing them today. This is just a way that formalizes uh, uh, that engagement between your organization and NCMEC. But I wanna reiterate that that doesn't, you do not have to be a partner to download our presentations or resources. However, many organizations have outreach efforts and we would simply like to be considered another partner in your internet safety efforts. Partner organizations, as I mentioned, just to kind of get, if you're thinking, is that a good fit for me? Uh, should we consider this? Should we take a look? The short answer is yes. <laughs> One way or another, we can connect and share resources. But as you can see from this slide, this is just a sampling uh, uh, of our uh, uh, partners. We have a few new uh, partners to add to this list a lot. I am in Austin, I am in Texas. And so that that is reflected. Uh, my work is reflected in the slide that you see. If you are not in Texas and are interested, please give me a call. Let's, let's work to expand this messaging. Let's work to make sure that every child and family has access to these resources. As you can see, a lot of CACs, why? They have trained uh, outreach personnel, usually on staff already, who are comfortable speaking in public. That's not a prerequisite per se, uh, but it certainly helps. Uh, you don't want to have to start from the ground up, but we can uh, help you within those efforts. Uh, Crime Stoppers is a big one. Uh, they continue to, to, uh, to, to reach a, a huge audience in the Houston, Texas area. We do have Spanish speaking partners, as you can see, Safe Child Coalition in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Um, we continue, Latanitas here in Austin provides STEM education to young girls. Uh, before every Latinita has access to uh, their equipment, is able to get online to research and, and, and participate in their STEM activities, they receive NetSmarts. It's an excellent approach to, to reaching children where they are. Uh, Texas Center for the Missing, Texas Education, Education Service Center, you name it, new and innovative ways. Southern Great Advocacy continues uh, uh, to impress with the ways that they meet folks in a very specific to rural Texas way. Um, they're at, they're at truck stop outreach, they're at gun shows, playing videos uh, of, of NetSmarts and KidSmarts, whatever it takes to get a parent and to get a trusted adult to swing by, pick up a, a worksheet or, or a pamphlet, anything about this very vital information. So again, I share this with you because if you're thinking if this is for you, I assure you it, it probably is. Uh, it's just another great way to get this vital information to folks. Other, other uh, partners throughout the country, as you can see here, super excited to partner with Safe, Sur Safe Surfing in Virginia, U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, rise up in Tennessee and so on and so forth. One police department to date, we're working on that. We'd love to partner with more police departments and assist in your community outreach efforts as well. Just a little a snippet about how this partnership could work in your prevention efforts. This again is coming from Southern Grid Advocacy in Wichita Falls. I'll give you a few seconds to read here. But again, I think the biggest takeaway is that uh, there's no need for you to reinvent the wheel. Um, we have free resources at the ready uh, that, that are, 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 are just ready to, to utilize in your community. There's no need to spend money on uh, developing uh, internet safety resources when you can utilize ours. I share this to highlight ways in which some of our smaller nonprofit partners have utilized this partnership. But again, I wanna reiterate, you do not have to be a partner to utilize our resources. Just another way to connect with each other and expand community capacity. And how have we done so far? You can see in 2021, 7,407 children and adults uh, received this vital internet safety information. They heard why it's important to talk to their kids about these issues. They heard a little bit about NCMEC statistics, the way we work, the way we can support their children. They heard about how to talk to their children about these issues. I could have never done this without the work of our community partners. I say I because I'm one outreach manager in Texas. I could present every day until the day I die and I would never reach every Texan. Am um, I being a little dramatic? Yes, but it's, it's to highlight that this absolutely requires a community approach. There's just no other way to look at this. We've got to work together to make sure that we're sharing this information with children and families. We've got to work together to prevent the next child from being sextorted, uh, from being enticed to share 
uh, 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 photos or videos of themselves. Uh, we've got to, to work together before the next child thinks it's okay to cyber bully another or before the next child is victimized, period. So how can we do that? We're gonna collaborate with one another. The partnership program highlighted all of the different ways Nick Nick does that. You can do this in your own community as well. After today's presentation, I hope that you're motivated and feel empowered with information, if anything, with where to go to find resources to help you to have these conversations uh, in your day to day. Child advocacy centers, absolutely. Local task forces, do you sit on an MDT? Uh, if so, at your next meeting, why not talk about hey, I, I learned all of these new statistics. Uh, we're acutely aware now about the ways that our children are being targeted online. We've got to incorporate this into our efforts and here's how. Domestic violence and sexual assault centers, there's absolutely a linkage between internet safety and child sex trafficking. That's an entirely different conversation, but we know that there's a linkage there too. There's absolutely, Again, this is this is child sex abuse. Uh, uh, when we think about things like sextortion and other issues, perhaps where a, a, a partner has in our children, they're dating, they break up and those images are shared online without consent. All of these elements of control and, and, and digital violence that are certainly have links with domestic violence and, and sexual assault as well. So is there a linkage between those issues and internet safety? Absolutely. Can we work with those organizations to share some of this information? Yes, and we should. Youth serving organizations, and health departments. This is a public health issue when we think about it, isn't it? So all of these different kinds of agencies in your local communities should hear about what you learned today. And we certainly hope that you'll consider utilizing our resources to do that. It's as easy as, as providing some, some pamphlets, some worksheets for kids, some coloring sheets for kids to use in the, in the waiting room. There are simple ways that we can tackle these very difficult issues. I mentioned earlier about being a trusted adult and what that means. Um, it's easy to consider. I myself feel that I'm a trusted adult for my nieces and my nephews, for some of the neighborhood children, and of course, for my own child. But am I equipped with what to say and what to do if and when a child takes me up on that? Right? We work so hard to say, I'm your trusted adult, and these are the things that are happening, and these are the choices I encourage you to make. Come to me. So they do. Now what? Uh, we have resources to help you with that as well. Uh, and you can, again, scan the QR code and visit our website to learn more about that, to download it, print it, and share it with all of the folks in your office, your community, uh, your family. Asking for help. This is intended for families as well. We want to make sure that, that children and, and, and everyone involved when there is an outcry understands how to navigate that difficult conversation and how to ensure that the child understands that they are heard. And of course, that they are connected with the resources uh, that they need. So you can find this on our website as well. Excellent tool, especially if you are already working at a CAC or another child serving organization, this is a great one to have on hand as well. Sextortion, sextortion, sextortion. You've heard us talk about it throughout the day because again, we continue to see an increase in these very, very dangerous uh, uh, crimes that continue to affect uh, especially um, you know, all children, but, but young boys are, are being targeted as well. And, and we have to make sure we understand that. Uh, oftentimes when I present information, I'll challenge the audience midway through, are you thinking about a young girl or a young boy? And oftentimes folks are, are thinking about a young girl. We cannot discount that all of the things we've talked about today absolutely occur with young boys, but we know that for a variety of societal cultural factors, young boys are less likely to uh, speak up about it. So let's be that bridge. Let's be prepared. Let's have these very important conversations with our children. This resource is available in Spanish as well uh, and also located and available for download from our website. A little bit about sexting. We're going to talk about that. I'm running a little low on time, so I'm going to share some statistics with you and a couple of resources from our friends at Thorne who continue to, uh, to, to, to interact and are able to provide, I say interact, they've conducted studies uh, directly with children and which have been extremely enlightening. Uh, and as you can see here, right, 47% of kids report feeling positive following the experience or exchange. Again, I want you to consider uh, dropping your misconceptions, your, your judgment about how children are engaging online and just accept that this is another facet that's not going away of how children are choosing to express themselves in, in, uh, you know, sexually and, and, and all of the above. 40% uh, agreed that it's normal 
uh, to participate in this behavior. Again, they don't know a world without the internet, without engaging and sharing information online. 60% of kids place blame on the victim. That's trouble. One in five kids said it's okay to share a nude as long as you send it over an app that doesn't save it. Not making that connection, right? They're not making that connection about how that's not necessarily the case. 60% of kids place blame on the victim. What does this tell us? That every child needs to hear uh, that when you are sharing, and oftentimes we hear that, I didn't take the picture, I'm not in the picture, I didn't do anything wrong, I just sent it to 200 of my contacts. Why am I in trouble? Um, we need to make sure that children understand that they do not have the consent that they are re-victimizing. Again, difficult conversations, but conversations that the statistics continue to show us are absolutely necessary. So again, sharing, uh, sharing nudes with a stranger versus someone you know among kids who've shared nudes. And again, this is based on a Thorn study that uh, we can definitely share a link to. Yes, I had met the person uh, or the people before, 62% both. So sharing with people they knew and they didn't, 27%. That's, that's, that's not a small number. Uh, and no, it's 10%. Again, these are the children who participated in the survey who were brave enough to share their responses. So we know that this has become a part of a child's experience uh, with the internet and with their sexuality. Why am I sharing this information? To really drill down on the importance of having these kinds of conversations. The first portion, we really talked about community approaches. We talked about reaching younger children. We don't ever want to discount the fact that we absolutely have to talk to, to our tweens and our older children too about some of these things. And how can we do it if we don't understand first, right? Which is one of the points that we mentioned earlier in the presentation. So we know we've got to talk to kids about sexting because we know that they're doing it. Um, oftentimes I, I get parents that come up afterwards and say, well, I know that my child would never. Um, that's cute, <laughs> that, that's, a, that's, that's hopeful, that's optimistic, um, but let's prepare them instead. And let's not make assumptions good or bad and let's prepare them instead, right? So we're, we have that sexting resource online uh, that you can share with children, you can post in your classroom uh, if, if you know, if that's okay, you can post in your youth center, whatever that looks like to get the conversation started and to point children to other resources as well. This is, uh, I, I wanna share this quickly, um, I have a few more minutes to with you uh, today. This is our most popular and most downloaded uh, or viewed video on our web, website out of all of our resources. It's short and to the point, and I think you'll see why it's so popular. It does an excellent job of cutting to the heart of this issue. So I'm going to hush and play this for you. You probably get lots of messages every day, but what if you got one like this? What would you do? Would you send a picture? No? Cool. That's an easy way to protect yourself. But what if you'd chosen differently? What if you send the picture? They'd never share it with anyone else, right? Do you want the picture shared with others? Sorry, you no longer have a choice. It's out of your hands now. Because sometimes, people we trust break that trust. Maybe the person you sent the picture to shows it to some friends. Maybe they send it to a couple friends, who send it to a couple more friends, who, you get the idea. It spreads, and you never know who might see it. Your little brother? Your mom? Other people at school? Even strangers could get a hold of your picture. You never really know where that picture will end up. How long it will be out there. Or what the consequences will be. Don't let others decide what happens to your image. Think before you share. Learn more at netsmarts.org. And hey, if your image is already out there, know that it's not your fault. For information about removing sexual pictures and videos from the internet, visit missingkids.org slash get help now. Wasn't that an excellent, gentle way to introduce the topic, talk about potential consequences, and to reiterate that as trusted adults, we're here to help? 
Um, I hope again, you can see why this is our most popular resource uh, uh, on our website. We have uh, coinciding discussion guides to help through this conversation. I've had many uh, a, a youth serving organization, police department, utilize this as part of a wider community effort, community night, uh, and bring in the, the, the kiddos, play the video, utilize the discussion guides about an hour, 30 minutes to an hour to get it, to get the conversation going, answer questions, and, and most importantly, to let the kids know that we're here. We, we know that these are some of the things that, they're, uh, uh, that they are in, uh, uh, encounter in their day-to-day -day lives as they continue to, to, to grow and socialize. Um, uh, it's just an excellent way to reach kids, uh, a great way to open the door to all of these other conversations. One thing to note here, we absolutely have a team of folks who can help to to uh, to remove some content from 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 the internet, um, we work with um, every major internet service provider to do so. One of my amazing colleagues in that uh, division, uh, I love what she says. She says we annoy into compliance, and it's true. <laughs> they will continue to to reach out and connect until these images are removed, and they have an excellent uh, return rate. Something like oh gosh, the number eludes me at the moment, but less than two, two, two to three days in most cases. So again, we're here uh, to, to have that conversation to hopefully prevent it. And we're also here to connect the child with resources if and when something happens. QR code there to find out more. Again, when you go to our website and download that discussion guide, it will be organized as such. You're gonna be prompted with questions about the choices that were made, some of the consequences, and it's gonna focus on healthy relationships, which is so important. We often project assumptions on children that they know what a healthy relationship looks like, but we never actually tell them what a healthy relationship looks like. And at the core of a lot of these extortion issues, a lot of these sexting uh, uh, scenarios is a lack of understanding that, hey, someone who truly cares about you wouldn't make you do something you don't wanna do. We recognize that and we want to help you have those conversations with children. Uh, to, tie, to tie up our conversation today, we really want to highlight uh, something that is important to consider when you are developing your approach uh, to have these conversations with the children in your communities. Uh, it's important to understand uh, what we're trying to protect our children from, right? So we know overall offender goals, so when, what we're trying to, to prevent, what we're trying to empower our children to recognize, uh, oftentimes with online enticement, uh, the goal, as I mentioned early in the presentation, is to collect content. So not necessarily to meet the child for sex, but to, to collect videos and images of children. Next, however, is sexual contact. Uh, it, then you can see so on and so forth, explicit conversation role play and financial gain. So that's extortion issue, which we continue to see on the rise. A little bit more about sextortion to tie up all of the things we discussed today and the importance of why we need to focus on having these conversations with our children. Look at that, victims ages ranged from eight to 17. We just talked about those objectives. Uh, we, we've got to get a handle on this situation. Uh, this data is a little outdated and we know that uh, you, can, you can guarantee that the numbers are increased across the board absolutely happens to young males. So again, I just wanted, wanted to reiterate uh, the importance behind talking to our children about sextortion and online safety at a young and early age. A little bit more about the THORN survey. Uh, a few highlights as we start to wrap up our presentation today. How did they meet the perpetrator? Did you catch that? I hope that you did. Let me move this to make sure that uh, everyone can see. So 49% had an existing relationship offline. I mentioned that earlier in our presentation today. Why do we move away from stranger danger conversations? Because statistically our children are more likely uh, to be exploited by someone that they know. 48% however met online. So we are walking a fine line here between protecting our children from making uh, from from uh, instances uh, reflective of unhealthy relationships and from strangers. So how do we walk that fine line? We have a conversation with them about all of the kinds of things they could uh, 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 encounter online and we empower them to make better choices. Again, I know this feels overwhelming, uh, but you are not alone. Uh, that's the biggest takeaway. You're not alone in your efforts. 62% complied with demands because they thought it would make 
the threats stop when, we, when we're more specifically talking about sextortion. So again, I, I'm sharing a lot of this at the end of the presentation because I wanted to first let you know uh, that you, as I mentioned, you're not alone. We have a ton of free resources to help you, but I wanted to close out by motivating you why it's important to make sure that we act on some of the things we're hearing about today. 62%, again, I'm gonna read it again, complied with demands because they thought it would make the threat stop. Our children are being threatened they're terrified and they're too afraid to come and talk to us. We've got to fix that. We have to work together to fix that. Again, shame or embarrassment. Do And, and again, this is embarrassing period for, for everyone involved. It's not a stretch to consider why a child might not want to talk about sex with their, their trusted adult, but more so that they were, um, that they were tricked, uh, right? That they were tricked into sharing personal photos and videos. Um, we need to create safe spaces for our children to feel okay to talk to us. And again, we can utilize the resources we talked about today. One in four victims were 13 or younger when they were threatened. All of this ties, so the THORN data, the, this, this survey just reinforces all of the things that we talked about today. Children are being affected at younger ages. We have to have conversations earlier and often. We need to make sure that our children understand that they can tell their parents about when something happens. We're a little short on time. I'd hope that we'd have enough time to share this video. It's okay that we don't. This is on Thorne's website. It's, uh, it features cats, <laughs> a cat that was sextorted. Uh, and it essentially much like the video I just shared with you. So it's super, it's super uh, tongue in cheek, but at the core is a very serious issue. Uh, it is available on Thorne's website, as you can see here, if you'd like to take note. I just wanted to share another resource to help you to connect with children about this topic. Uh, it's very relatable, it's funny, and it's also at the core, as I mentioned, is this very serious issue and it, it empowers children to feel, uh, first of all, that their trusted adults know that this is a thing uh, that they can turn to us to talk about. Additional NCMEC resources as we close out the day. As I mentioned, we offer free online training via NCMEC Connect. Sign up for an account today and just open, uh, open up a world of on-demand self-paced training opportunities for yourself and your staff. Uh, our Intro to Child Sex Trafficking is an excellent level set for everyone on your staff, in your community, in your family. It does an excellent job of introducing the topic uh, and providing you with insight on how to recognize it, prevent it, and address it. As we mentioned, we can help to remove sexually explicit content. Visit our website uh, to learn more, and here's exactly where you, you can go. Just a quick few highlights about that. As I mentioned, we offer a ton of free services and, and we do not go away until the, the, the family tells us we no longer need your help. Here's a quick list of some of the ways that we can help. If you are a mental health service provider, uh, give us a call, visit our website. We'd love to connect with you uh, if you're interested in partnering with us in these efforts. Peer support, I can't, I can't stress enough the amazing work that they do. Uh, many of those folks still have a child who's missing. Many of them have a child who has been exploited or they are uh, survivors of exploitation themselves and have used that, uh, that pain and that tragedy to try to help others. So uh, give us a call, uh, visit our website and find ways to connect either someone in your own life, your personal uh, 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 circle or uh, professionally. We'd love to be an extra resource for you. I encourage you to report missing incidents, suspected child sex trafficking, sus suspected online sexual exploitation, sexual exploitation period. Uh, please call 1-800-THE-LOST or report to the cyber tip line. Uh, we will connect you with the resources that you need and, and start getting to work to bring perpetrators to justice and, and uh, supports to survivors. As I mentioned, here are just a quick list of all of the different ways that you can utilize some of these resources today. Uh, report suspected online sexual exploitation and trafficking, obviously. Incorporate our resources into your existing prevention programming. Share NetSmart's tip sheets, coloring books, and brochures. Offer training to all school staff if you have access. Uh, access refer survivors to NCMEC for help removing sexually explicit content. And of course, refer families to NCMEC. These are some easy ways just to make sure we're closing that loop. We're making sure that from beginning to end, a, a child has either been exposed to prevention, education, including their family, their caregivers, uh, and if and when something happens, that they know where to find help as well. Here's my contact information. 
Uh, you can always reach outreach at nickmic.org to, to get in touch with me or my colleagues. Uh, a few quick QR codes, right? The, the year of the QR code uh, continues. Um, to find out more, you can sign up for updates here if you'd like to take a couple of snapshots here. Uh, that is what I have for you today with one minute to spare. <laughs> so uh, I covered a lot of information, a lot of it a little intimidating or scary. But I, I just believe in my heart that together we can uh, uh, prevent another child from being victimized. And, and I hope that you uh, uh, believe me and hear me when I tell you you have a new friend at NICMIC in Austin. Please reach out. I'm happy to help however I can. Thank you so much for your time.